It's Andre from the High Performance Academy, and I'm here with Greg Banish from Calibrated Success. Uh, Greg's uh, quite an interesting guy. He's got a pretty rich history in EFI tuning. He's uh, one of the few guys that I've met here who is involved in OEM tuning, so not just the standalone aftermarket stuff that uh, most of us are into. He's actually doing uh, OEM tuning for OEM engines, so it's pretty interesting. Uh, Greg, um, can you tell us a little bit about your history? How did you get started tuning? I started tuning actually on my own personal car. Um, I wasn't even into cars, if you can believe that, until I got into college. I went to engineering school, so I have a degree in mechanical engineering with an automotive specialty, and that's where I really fell in love with the idea of modifying a car. I started reading some of the magazines even and say, hey, you can take parts and add them to a Ford Mustang and make it as fast as a Porsche or Ferrari or even faster, and that just fascinated me. So I started going further and further down that path. I wanted to learn everything I could. So it led me to learn how the engines really work, and then, as a consequence, how do the control systems work? And what we find is that everything in the control systems is based on the physics of what drives an engine in the first place. Okay, so getting from, from sort of a hobby into doing OEM level tuning, how do you sort of take that step? Because that's a, it's a pretty bold step, and I know a lot of people watching this will be interested to see how you can get there. It, for me, it was jump in with both feet. You know, I started with my own car, you kind of tip dip your toe in the water to start, right? You play with your own car, if you break it, you have nobody to blame but yourself. And I did some work with my car and it was successful. So then it starts with, hey, friends say, hey, can you do that with mine? Yeah, okay. And you start doing it and you, you grab a new car with new software and you kind of learn it and you go, oh, well, that's how they're doing this and this software. You know, we all need to figure out how much air went into the cylinders. And I'm used to doing it, okay, on this system with a mass airflow sensor, but these guys solve it with a speed density equation, but they get the same number. Oh, okay, and the light bulb goes on over your head, and you go, ah, oh, you know, that's it. So a little bit of practice, and you start seeing similarities between the systems. And a lot of that, if you can believe it, boils down to high school physics. So you don't necessarily need an engineering degree to tune a race car. And so if we explain it to you in plain English, and you relate it to things that you've already seen in some common sense terms, hey, you know, when air is hot, it's less dense. You know, oh, okay, you know, all we need to do is react to that. Find the table that has temperature in it, and we adjust that table. So it's really kind of a matter of, of applied common sense and a little bit of high school algebra to make the cars run better. So that degree, though, is kind of important if you actually want to be working for an OEM level uh, manufacturer as opposed to just doing it as a hobby or running a performance workshop. Yeah, there's a big difference between working at the OEM level. At the OEM level, we have to pass emissions or the cars don't get sold at all. You know, so it, what really drives formations of oxides and nitrogen, right? That's a college level class. You know, in the aftermarket, does my car run? Check. Does it, you know, does it not run rough? Does it not make smoke? Am I burning clean? Does a Lambda sensor say 1.0 at part load? Okay, great. You know, we can't get away with being that rough at the OEM level. So to understand the underlying concepts, that's where, you know, a proper engineering degree is absolutely required to get a job at the OEM level usually. Um, but for the aftermarket shop tuner, you can learn a lot of what you need by getting some good outside technical training. Some of the technical schools work really well. Some classes are available. They're taught by people who really know how these things work. And that can get you started. So, you know, there's a big difference between, you know, kind of the, the enthusiast level and the, you know, engineering level of it. You know, as we get into the new direct injection systems with twin variable camshafts and torque-based turbo controls, it gets pretty deep, and the controls get pretty deep. There's a lot of calculus involved, and you know, it makes my head spin some days. So you're saying basically our job in the aftermarket is a whole bunch easier than your job at OEM? Incredibly easier. In fact, that's why I do this for fun on the side, because it's easy, right? You know, making a fixed cam race car engine run is child's play compared to what we have to play with at work and you know, just making it run no problem make some horsepower we want more horsepower we add more airflow at the OEM level we say oh geez you know that extra airflow that might make too much load and this part was you know designed to be right on the limit and now we broke our durability limit oh you, know, well, you can't get away with that horsepower wise on the aftermarket a lot of guys you know if they break parts because they made too much power they put it up on the wall as kind of a badge of honor doesn't really happen at OEM level. Uh, one, one thing I just wanted to talk about there is um, emissions. Now, uh, one, one thing we've always said is, you know, with road cars, it doesn't really matter how much power the engine's making. It doesn't really matter a damn anything else about the engine, how flash it is, what the technology is. Basically, if that engine can't pass emission standards, uh, it's not going to go on the road, so no one's ever going to see it. How much of a challenge is that emissions law for you, particularly as it gets more, um, more stringent, more difficult to pass? Uh, it occupies a large part of the team's time. You know, and keep in mind, there's not one guy making one engine run in a 
program. Typically, we have six or seven different people working on the program, and probably two or three of those guys are doing specifically emissions calibration. So they're running the cycles. So both the U.S. federal F FTP cycles, the European cycles, the Japanese cycles, you know, there's there's a couple other cycles that we have to run, and we have to check every single one of those and make sure that along the cycle we don't violate the limits for you know, both you know, the normal stuff is, you know, hydrocarbons and NMOG and CO and NOx. But now with DI, we have on gasoline, we start worrying about particulate matter and how much smoke comes out the tailpipe. And so we've got some very expensive smoke meters that we have to use. And if you tip into power and it's too cold or we put the fuel in a little late in the cycle and we start creating smoke, it blows the whole test and we start all over again. So a whole bunch of stuff that's really not that valuable for us in the aftermarket when we're chasing power. Um, it's not important for power, but I think it's important to be green. It, we're not going to overtly pollute on high power cars. There is, you know, the OEMs have shown us today that we can make tremendous amounts of horsepower and still be very clean on emissions. You know, if you look at the current crop of cars, it's not hard to buy a 600 horsepower car at a dealership today that has a warranty and passes emissions. So my goal when I do aftermarket work is always let's make this thing run as clean as it can. I've never had a customer come back to me and complain that I made them get better fuel economy. Totally. Okay, let's just talk a little bit about the differences between the OEM ECUs, uh, PCMs that you're used to tuning, and the standalones that are out there on, on the in the aftermarket that we're probably more used to from the, the road car, race car stuff. You know, so w how do the two compare? How much more sophisticated is an OEM, like a brand new OEM ECU? Well, it's night and day. It, you know, the aftermarket standalones are actually pretty simple. A lot of them are basic speed density models. Some of them now allow us to use a mass airflow sensor. We can switch between the two. Even with all that, we might have, let's say, 200 tables available, you know, different knobs that we could turn. On the OEM side, our current crop of controllers that we use, uh, keep in mind, we've got more features going on. So we've got twin variable cams. We've got a torque-based ETC system, a torque-based turbocharger boost control system. You know, we've got direct injection with variable injection pressures and times, and you've got this big time-space domain for fuel inside of the cylinder. All that works out to be uh, about 14,000 different variables available in the ECU for us to adjust at any one time. You know, now, we're not adjusting every one of those all day long, but that's how many options we have. And there's a lot of stuff that is calibratable by us that we would set once at the very beginning of the program and never change again because, obviously, the, the angles on the crank throws aren't going to change relative to the teeth on the crank sensor, but we need to define those. They need to be spelled out somewhere. And as we add variable cams and multiple cams on the engine, we need to diagnose where each one of those are along the way. So the diagnostics that might cause anything to be misaligned or even start to increase pollutants all have to be monitored. And so those diagnostics eat up roughly about half of the processing capability of these ECUs. So again, in the aftermarket, the manufacturer's jobs are a whole bunch easier because they're looking at a general ECU that can run just about any engine. It's not so specifically defined on, on one engine where it, it will look at absolutely every single parameter for that engine, that'd be fair? Yes, and it, you know, the beauty of the aftermarket is they are that flexible. So that same control box could work on 20 different engines. And we can calibrate it to say, hey, it's four cylinder versus six cylinder versus eight. And you know, it's a 36 minus one wheel or it's a 60 minus two wheel. And they say, okay, well, it's generally here. Now, they're not doing misfire monitoring at 7,000 RPM the way the OEM ECU is. You know, if we have a really bad misfire, some of the more sophisticated standalones might catch it and might give you a little bit of warning. The aftermarket it has the luxury of not being held to monitoring that by some federal law that says, hey, you must have this or you can't sell the car. What we need to do is get a car that runs smooth enough for our customer to say, yep, I can drive this. So for the guy on the street, maybe you've got a race car, maybe it's just a modified street car. If you had your choice of running an OEM ECU and tuning that specifically for the modifications versus even a sophisticated aftermarket ECU, what would be your choice? Uh, for the street car, I mean, if you bought it with a working OEM ECU and you're going to do a mild modification, modifying the stock ECU is usually a pretty tasty option because we don't need to rewire the entire car. If we have a client who comes to us and says, hey, we're going to run in this race series, we're starting with a tube chassis, and we need to start laying things out from scratch, those standalones work really good and it simplifies things a lot. Yeah, totally. Okay, now you're also running uh, Calibrated Success, which you, you're doing EFI training. If um, people wanted to have a look at your stuff there, how can they get hold of you? CalibratedSuccess.com is the website. 
uh, you know, we've got a couple of videos and books that are available. The guys at Summit Racing Equipment and a few other distributors are uh, handling that for me. I don't sell them direct, but um, we're going to be working on some new material coming forward. Uh, I've got a lot of questions from people asking me about things like E85 and ethanol-based tuning. So I've got a, uh, another test car that I'm going to start working on this summer that is going to be the test mule for a lot of that. We'll start showing people how those systems work and what's really different between gasoline and ethanol and unlock some of the myths and mysteries that people have been complaining about. Great. Look, I can't wait to see what you come out with, Greg, when you start doing that, uh, that sort of training. So thanks a lot for taking the time to chat to us today. All right. Thank you. For online tuning courses, visit learntotune.com.